Um, first, I'd like to say I'm really honored to have been asked to be part of your symposium. And um, it says in the, in the little bio thing that I do a lot of different things that are seemingly not related. Um, if you can follow me through about 40 years of work, I think I can demonstrate that they are definitely related. Um, and I, in, uh, th the work is in roughly chronological order. Now, I grew up in the Midwest on a farm, and um, my father was a farmer, but he was also a craftsman in his own right. Um, and he had a home-built airplane before World War II that had a Model A Ford engine in it, and he raised potatoes at the time, and he got tired of dusting those by hand, and so he made a crop duster, which was the first one in the Midwest, and dusted his potatoes with that. And he taught my brother and two sisters how to do things, mainly. We built things. He brought us home uh, model airplane kits. I remember the first one was just a block of wood, and you carve away what doesn't look like an airplane. And later on, I discovered that was the subtractive process. <laughs> I learned this from Brent in grad school. And then the second one was a bunch of sticks. You open the box, and there's a bunch of sticks and tissue paper. And you put it together to make an airplane. And I realized that was the additive process. So um, as I look back on it, I'm pretty good at both of those. And I trace it back to what my father did and what he taught me. Um, this first slide is actually important because he made things for us as well. This is a, an airplane. That's me um, cranking the prop. And he made garden tractors and things like that. I think I learned to weld when I was about seven years old. Um, and being in the Midwest, there's not much else to do, so we made things. Either, in the Midwest, you're either a jock or a gearhead, and I definitely wasn't a jock. So, let's see. This was my high school science fair project. <laughs> I wanted a car when I was about 16, and my father wouldn't let me buy one. He said I didn't need one, so I bought parts. I bought a body home, an old 31 Chevy body. Um, and then the next day, he gave me an engine out of his 40 Ford. He'd put a big block Chevy engine in it. So um, it progressed from there. Um, I learned a lot doing things like the upholstery. One day he came home with a, an old shoe repair machine, a walking foot sewing machine. So I learned how to do the upholstery, very tasty black nonga hide with chrome buttons. <laughs> um, and I, I did everything on it, um, the painting and the whole works. I spent most of my time in Jerry Mostek's junkyard scavenging parts off of other cars. Um, I, um, this is a motorcycle that I started in an undergraduate sculpture class in Mankato, Minnesota. I started in engineering and chemistry and quickly discovered that that's not where I belonged. That was a little bit too confining. So I switched into, into art, crafts, whatever you want to call it. And at that time, Mankato had a very good crafts program. Uh, the teachers in metal were from Cranbrook, so I learned to raise. And it was well-rounded. I did everything from glass blowing, ceramics, weaving. Um, prints, um, but mainly it was in the 60s, and I was a hippie. I had long hair and played in a rock and roll band, so I think I missed most of college. Um, this, this is another motorcycle I did. I graduated from undergraduate school, I think, in 69, uh, and then for 10 years I was self-employed. I, I basically built choppers, which in, that, in those days was an art form. It was way before OMC, the Orange County Choppers, and Jesse James, and all the Harley people now back then were in college. The Harley people now are mainly lawyers and doctors and whatnot, and they used to throw stuff at us bikers back then, because back then you were either a hippie or you were a hell's angel or something. And so I was a hippie. And I did just straight paint work on lots of other motorcycles. Um, just made my living like that for a long time, for 10 years, actually. And then I got really tired of doing all that. Uh, oh, excuse me, another project. My brother got into geodesic domes. And so we built the first two geodesic domes on a wood frame with ferro cement on it. And it's, this particular one, he still lives in. It's 44 foot in diameter, and it's all covered on the inside with uh, random width oak boards that are tongue and grooved. And then uh, metal mesh and ferrule cement, insulation metal mesh and ferrule cement. Um, I got tired of living in the Midwest, 
And so I applied to grad school at Carbondale with Brent Kington, and he let me in on probation. But I, I got there at a very opportune time because it was when they had just started the initial research along with the Pijanowskis at Purdue on the Mokumegani. And Philip Baldwin and I grabbed that and ran. It was a, it was a class project for all the grad students, but it was Philip and I that were most interested in it. These are some early pieces. I think this is the first actual real piece of Mokume that I made. It's a coin bank uh, with a silver insert, and it's got a three-dial combination lock on the bottom. If you turn those three little knobs on the right-hand side to the appropriate dot, which corresponds to a number, and push that button, there's a spring hinge that flips the door open. Um, Here's another one. This uh, is uh, actually not as big as it looks. And please excuse the, the back, background and all these. Some of these slides are 30 years old. I had them scanned, and some of them didn't clean up very well. Um, I don't know why I had them stored in a shoebox, and it actually had a lid on it. So, <laughs> yeah. this, this is another bank that was sort of a collaborative piece between Philip and I. That last piece was done by uh, doing a huge block, a billet of Mokume, I think it was about four inches square, and then I took a bandsaw and sawed slices off it. So what I had essentially was a piece of metal rolled out to about 18 gauge that had perfectly linear parallel stripes. Um, and on this one, Philip wanted to relaminate them, and I was too lazy, so I gave him five or six pieces, and he refused them with the, the alternate directions. And then I silver soldered it to a piece of steel and turned in the lathe concentric rings and then forged it out. And so it interrupted those layers in uh, real abrupt ways. And it was a real crisp pattern until for some stupid reason I decided to file it and get a smooth texture on it, or uh, no texture at all. And even that little bit of filing in the, the plantish texture broke it up so much that there are no hard lines in it any longer. And going back to this other one, it's really fun to raise it because you, you have an actual pattern in the metal. And you can see on the top of this coin bank that's how wide those stripes were initially. And as you raise it and pull the metal in, it shrinks or compresses, gets thicker, and stretches out. And the lines do the same thing. Um, this is the first fairly large piece that I did. It's, I think, about eight or nine inches in diameter. And the, the, the rim is uh, turned copper, pressed in. Um, the second one, similar. This, this one is a little larger. I think this is probably 12 or 13 inches tall. Same basic rim system. This is a later one. I still do some Mokume pieces, but I'm not really set up to fuse the material anymore. And so Philip has graciously um, agreed to send me a raw billet that's uh, not, no pattern in it. This particular one, I think, was about an eight or nine inch square, probably a half or five eighths inches thick. Um, and then I cut a circle out of it, and I develop all my pattern in the Bridgeport milling machine with a ball end mill. Um, and then it's forged out into a sheet and then raised. And you, you can't actually, or I don't, uh, on my pieces, want to use a rolling mill. I didn't have one large enough anyway, so it has to be hand forged out. I generally go up to Penlin, which is a mile down the road, and dress the dies in their trip hammer and hammer it out. Um, and on, as far as pattern development, I want total control over what the pattern is, so I only develop pattern once and then forge it out. If you develop pattern partially, forge it out, and then go back in and develop more pattern, you don't have a perfectly linear stack system any longer, and so you don't know where you're interrupting the layers, and so you get what you get. Uh, this is a later one. This is uh, probably three or four years old. The rims are, this is actually anodized aluminum rim, and I make those in a Bridgeport milling machine on a, on a rotary table, and they're also pressed in. This one has a high percentage of gold in the shock of dough, and it's uh, not very dramatic because the gold is actually fire scale, and I left it on there rather than abrade it and get the dark out of the shock of dough. But I, I'm thinking now that it would be more dramatic, since it's not been sold, to go back and... <laughs> 
and, and strip the, the fire scale, the gold, off of the surface and then replanish it so it's got a planished texture and then put it in the Roca show to get the color and at that point I'll have to make a new rim because it will have changed the form somewhat. Um, this is another piece a little bit earlier. Again, anodized aluminum components in it. And this is the last one I did. I did this uh, this summer early summer for the, the major Penland auction. This is also, again, a piece of metal that Philip sent me. And I believe it's uh, copper and brass, is that? Copper and brass. Um, I've been self-employed most of my life, and so if I don't work, I don't get any money. I don't have a check coming in every month. So I do a lot of straight things like chalices. Um, also, in backing up again into grad school, um, Brent had seen the pictures of those Harleys that I built, and he suggested that I, that I do something with that. So I did a series of adult fantasy toy hobby horses. Uh, this, is the, <laughs> this is the first one. It's on a Harley scale, and you can sit on a rock, but it's uh, uh, not really a functional item. It's uh, more conceptual, I guess. Um, another one, this is uh, sort of derived from a T-33 jet trainer, which goes back to the first block of wood my father got me that he said was an airplane after I carved it. Uh, another one, the imagery for this came from a friend's pit bull named Roger. <laughs> and this one uh, comes from my father, I guess. I was, you know, built airplanes, go-karts, hang gliders, and I always wanted to fly. I think it was mainly because I was in the Midwest and it was so damn flat, I just wanted to get up off of it and see what it looked like. But, um, and in 2003, the North Carolina Museum did a show uh, for the Wright Brothers anniversary, a tribute to the Wright Brothers, and they uh, asked me to put this piece in, which was all, this was done at Penland when I first got there in 1980, and so I, d I did another one. Whoops, wrong order. This is another earlier one. I did this one, which was uh, sort of a tribute to my father. Um, it was a fantastic show. If you didn't see it, uh, you really missed something. <laughs> these are these are made um, with a steel armature, steel tubing, and then the body forms are made up of styrofoam, just the blue styrofoam like you buy at the hardware store, the, the building supply, uh, carved to shape, and then covered with uh, either fiberglass or dynel cloth and epoxy resins, and then use body putty and uh, typical body body shop details to finish it out and then uh, sprayed with, uh, the first ones were lacquer, the later ones are all polyurethanes. Uh, it's the same technology that's used in uh, some home-built airplanes um, and surfboards and, and a lot of different things. Um, I go off on tangents periodically and I had all of these uh, aircraft metalworking tools, riveters and like Rosie the Riveter and things like that, shrinkers and stretchers, and so I, I thought it might be a good idea to do some sculptural forms out of it. I did several kites. This is one kite. I think it's a six or seven foot wingspan. You know, you can see all of the, the sort of armatures that are made up out of angle, riveted together. Um, a garlic bread platter that's about three foot in diameter. But I had envisioned doing really large things that I, I figured I could do all the drawings out to scale and then just make components and put huge pieces together. That, that's the way 747 is made. But I sort of lost interest in it. Um, another avenue that went nowhere. I did a few pieces with plate glass and uh, at that time I was back anodizing aluminum. I had done it earlier with the motorcycle things uh, as well as the chrome plating on those. Uh, and plate glass, little constructive things. This one's called pain plate. Using nickel silver anodized aluminum, small stainless hardware. Um, I lost interest in this pretty quickly as well. Um, something that I, that I do periodically just for fun, these were from grad school, are pocket knives. Uh, the bottom one is a, a tiny one that's uh, about three inches in length, total length with the blade open. And if you push that little button forward, it flicks out. It's a switchblade and everybody laughed at it. So I did the top one, which is my Harley knife, <laughs> which when you push that button, you better hang on to it because it about flies out of your hand. And the middle one is just a, a Mokume scaled 
regular knife. Various shapes, just fun things to do. Um, I got a commission from a, a client to do a, a large locking folder and he wanted Damascus. I don't do Damascus. I'm not a ferrous person as far as forging goes. So Philip supplied the Damascus steel and I've done several of those. Um, I wasn't, at that time, I was teaching uh, the concentration at Penn in both the fall and the spring sessions. I think I did that for about five years. The programs are, are arranged totally differently now. But I wasn't living on school property any longer and I needed to make money. I had uh, a huge anodizing system that we uh, set up at Penland. The dyes were in 55 gallon barrels and I think the anodizing tank was 200 gallons, something like that. And so for uh, four or five years, I guess, I did a uh, sort of a line of limit production lamps and tables, um, things like that. The, they were all machined out pretty much the same, repetitive. The fun part was doing the color. And this was back in the Miami Vice days when all of these colors were popular, the mint greens, the mauves, the taupes. Um, I tried to stay away from the, the typical really vibrant purples and blues that you generally see with anodizing. And anodizing is, is really quite fun because it's an electrochemical dye system. And so you have an unlimited color palette. If you want a turquoise, you don't need to have a turquoise dye. You can have a blue and a green. And if you dip it in one, rinse it, and go in the other, you get a combination of the two. So it was really fun playing with the colors. I did a lot of them with grays and just put a little bit of a color in it. So you had like shaded grays. Um, I'm not saying these are very subtle colors. But. <laughs> The mint, mint green and sort of a salmon color was really popular back then. I sold these in uh, galleries across the country. Um, I got the initial contact with the galleries by doing uh, the Baltimore wholesale show. I did that for uh, two or three years, I guess, and then once I had the contacts, I didn't do that any longer. Um, This is a variation of the short one. If you've got a good idea, milk it if you can. So do a tall one, too. <laughs> uh, another torchere. And of course, make a wall lamp out of the same thing, which is just this, the same elements. Um, I did a, quite a few tables. Some of them were uh, anodized parts with glass tops, although getting glass cut to shape and the, well, perfectly and the exact size you wanted was hit or miss. Um, and the, a technique in anodizing is sort of a dye resist technique, that, which has been going on for a long time. A lot of the signs were made where you, you dye it one color, you apply a resist, either asphaltum or a lacquer base or whatever, and then go back in and bleach the colors out. Initially, I was using a commercial bleach, which didn't, didn't work very well, and someone came through Penland and said, all I have to do is dump it back in the the sulfuric acid and it does the same thing. So that was sort of a revelation. And then I came up with a, a resist that was lacquer based that would come out of a spray gun like cotton candy. And, and so I could dye it one color, spray the resist on, bleach it, go back into another color and do it again maybe three or four times. And it had a real nice quality. It sort of looked like some marble. So I nicknamed it Penland Marble. That was the top of a table actually. Um, most of my work is uh, functional. You know, like I said, I'm from the Midwest, and you've got to be fairly pragmatic if you're from, if you're from the Midwest. And so I gravitate towards functional items, well designed, they have to work, but I think they should look good as well. And a lot of my, or most of my work, I guess, is uh, symmetrical, and I think that's because I grew up in the Midwest, it was flat. If you go up in the air, everything is laid on an exact one mile square grid. So you can't go southwest or northeast. You can only go north, south, east, or west, <laughs> unless you're by the river where the, where the road followed the river. And so there's symmetry in that, plus all the cornfields are in perfectly spaced linear things for miles and miles and miles. And the telephones are telephone poles, light poles, they are as well. And it's, it's really hard to overcome that. So I'm more comfortable with symmetrical things. Um, one of my students, I taught a, a Hollower class this summer at Penland, 
and one of my students was a, a jeweler metalsmith from Philadelphia, and he was a, a really great drawer, and he'd get commissions from people, and he would ask them questions like, which are you more comfortable with? Three dots all in a row, evenly spaced, or random, and things like that, to get a feel for what they were comfortable with, whether they were into symmetry or asymmetry, before he'd even design them a piece. Because obviously he wanted them to be happy with it, so he wanted to do something for them that they'd like, which I thought was fairly interesting. Tall tables, nice slide, huh? Um, clipboards. Once again, you know, all the same except for the color. Titanium springs on them, which are also colored. Um, and then in 92, I had the opportunity to uh, join a three-man team to uh, move up to Boston for two and a half years. A friend of mine, Ken Parker, designed this guitar, um, went out and got two and a half million dollars startup money from Korg, uh, a big Japanese-American music company who sell Marshall amplifiers, among other things. And they wanted me to join them in doing the, the prototypes and getting this guitar in production. So for two and a half years, I lived in Boston. Ken and I did the prototypes. And Larry Fish, Fishman from Fishman Transducers, who make piezo crystal pickups for most of the acoustic guitars in the world, um, <clears throat> was another part of that team. Um, this is a pretty phenomenal guitar in that it's, uh, it was probably the, the first and best use of carbon fiber in a musical instrument. Other people had done it, but there was no reason to have carbon fiber in the instrument. And the way Ken designed this, he's using uh, really light tone woods. And uh, popular wisdom says that in an electric guitar, the wood doesn't make any difference. It's all in the pickups, which is not true at all. Um, it's totally dependent on the wood and the, the way it's constructed. And every piece of wood has a slightly different sound. Ken liked really light woods because they were real bright sounding. Um, and the lighter the guitar is, the better it sustains. And so he chose like basswood, poplar, and things like that, which aren't structurally strong enough to take the stresses of the strings. And so there's an exoskeleton of carbon fiber on the back of it to give it the strength. And the fretboard on these are carbon fiber. And traditional instruments have nickel silver frets. And they're just pressed into the fret, or into the neck, excuse me, and put together. And if it doesn't play correctly, if some of the frets buzz, you just take a file and file them down until it does play. Well, these have uh, uh, hardened stainless steel frets, which are actually glued onto the carbon fiber fretboard. And the only way to file them is with a diamond file which in produ production is not going to work. And so we had to devise a way that we could uh, manufacture these guitars so the neck was absolutely perfect in every one, or the guitar was junk, which was uh, sort of a challenge. Um, and let's see. It, it was also in Massachusetts. And so we were really observant of the air quality issues up there. And so we were trying to build a green guitar. So part of my job was to, to, to resolve the finishing issues on this guitar. And so we were using a 100% polymer finish for the primer and the guitar, no solvents in it whatsoever, so you couldn't spray it. So we dipped the guitar. I made it a, a system to dip the guitar. And then it was swung over on a mast as it rotated so it wouldn't drip into an ultraviolet booth, and the paint was cured with ultraviolet light, which no fumes, you know, or very few fumes, not many at all. Um, but there were some problems with it, and two and a half million dollars is not enough to start up a company like this. And we were running out of money, and so we abandoned that, and we spray them at this point. Um, let's see, and a another thing that I thought was really interesting was that Ken designed this guitar, and the, you can see the, the little saddles, they're called, in the, in the bridge or the tailpiece that hold the strings are made out of PM parts, because P, which is particle metal parts, because they're the cheap way to do it. Each one of those costs us a few cents, then they were made out of stainless steel. And the way that is done is to have a female mold and pack 
a powdered metal in it, it could be bronze, it could be brass, stainless steel, almost any metal, and then a male ram comes in and compresses it really tightly, and then it's taken out and put in a, in a kill or an oven and centered, brought up to the temperature much like when we were doing mokume. And they're really inexpensive to make. And we were showing this guitar to someone, and he said, oh, that's old-timey design. And I started to think, what's he talking about? And the saddles on this have real curvilinear lines. And I realized that what he was saying was that the typical competitor's guitar, all of those saddles are rectilinear. And I started thinking, they're rectilinear because to make the, the molds for the particle metal, you use, need to use an EDM machine which is an electrical discharge machine that goes into hardened tool steel and burns the, the metal away to make the pocket. And to, to do each pocket, you need at least five or six carbon electrodes for that. And so they all have to be machined exactly the same. And this is in 92 or 93, and the CNC machines weren't much in those days. And they tried to do, we had a positive that Ken handmade, and they tried to, to do it on milling machine and it was pitiful. And finally, they let us do it when they realized they were getting no money from us unless they could have some electrodes. So I sat for like three days with my optivizer and riffler files carving these electrodes. And so these were some of the first curvilinear PM parts that were ever out there. And I began to realize that he thought this was old-timey design because what he was used to looking at were all rectilinear parts. Um, and what people think is old-timey design or new design, current design, is actually dictated by process because that's what they see and that's what the trends, uh, styles, whatever you want to call it, come from. If you think back in the 20s and 30s, things were curvilinear then because most parts, commercial parts, were cast and the patterns could be made out of mahogany and, and cast in that sense. Um, another thing that goes back to sort of to what Arthur was saying, that these uh, bodies and necks were cut on a CNC milling machine. But it, uh, back then, the, uh, the technology has come a long ways in 20 years in the CNC. Um, the CNC routers weren't up to the task, so we had a CNC milling machine. And we were actually working in reverse because everything that went along with CNC in those days was, came from CAD CAM or AutoCAD drawings and then went to the machine to make. And we were working in reverse because Ken had made this guitar and so we got a digitizing probe and went over the entire body and the neck every, in a 100,000 square grid and then took all of those entries and tried to run them through a CNC or a PC to run the CNC machine. And of course that crashed right away because there were thousands and thousands of uh, bits in there that it just couldn't handle. So. Um, Larry Fishman found a, a software called, I believe it was called SurfCam, that was supposed to take a whole row of those entries and put it in as one so the PC could handle it. And he worked for months and months on it, and nothing was working. And finally one day, just out of the blue, or one night, about four in the morning, he decided to change the X and Y axis around, and all of a sudden everything started to work. Whoever did the software had the X and Y axis confused. So. But, he was a little hot. Not, you know. um, so these are all uh, carved on a CNC milling machine. We had made vacuum chucks to hold them to the machine, um, and that machine ran 24 hours a day. Um, these guitars were actually fifth in sales in the world for a while, but they have since been bought out because uh, we could never make any money at it because it was they were just too labor intensive. And a, another point here is. Um, Ken was totally free with any information that we came up with. We figured if we can hardly make them, nobody else can either, <laughs> which is true. I learned a lot about um, consumer products, about uh, you know, working with different materials, new materials, research in technology, and I learned a lot about hiring people to help. <laughs> this is our drying rack for a while. This, we moved into a, a, let's see, a 100 by 200 foot building, which was totally empty, and filled it up by the time we were done. And since this was not typical construction, 
we had to pretty much make all of the, the machinery to do it ourselves. And we tried hiring engineers. That never worked. <laughs> so we basically had to do it. Okay, after I was there for two and a half years, and when I came back to Penland, I was no longer interested in doing the anodized aluminum furniture and things. Plus, I'd pretty much lost my galleries and contacts at that point, being gone for two and a half years. So I started doing some other projects of furniture oriented. These are some stools that I designed. The first ones were three-legged, and then I went to a four-legged stool. The, the seats and the, the legs are made out of uh, curly maple, fiddleback maple. Um, they're, the legs are triangular in cross-section. They're tapered and they're curved. And to, to make these legs, especially in curly maple, to carve them out, is almost impossible. I don't know how many of you worked with curly maple, but it tears and you have voids in it and everything. So there was a firm down in Hickory, North Carolina that services the, the furniture industry down there that has uh, Salstrom copy lays is what they're called. It's old technology. It's probably, I, I would guess, 40s, 30s or 40s, something like that. And what I did was I carved a master out of hard maple, uh, just carved one of these legs out, and then they put it in the machine in the center, and then they put blanks. Depend, they're modular machines, and they can have a, a 6 unit, a 12, or an 18 unit. So I'd carve them or cut out 18 blanks, and then they'd follow it with a stylus. And they had individual router heads on each one that would cut these parts out. And there was no tear out. The knives were sharp enough that they'd come out. And then all I had to do was go to a bag sander and sand them, and then do the finish work. Um, and the, the paint on it is uh, the same system I set up for Parker Guitars. It's a, a polyurethane. It's transparent, going back to the hot rod days and things like that. And it's really nice because it colored, but you can see through it and you can see the grain of the wood. The other parts are stainless steel and anodized aluminum parts machined out. And I, I started doing uh, some furniture items. There's the upholstery from the hot rods showing back up again and the paint. Stainless steel, anodized aluminum, wood, leather. Uh, some more parts that I had done at the, the firm in um, Hickory, some of the, the bedpost items. Again, incorporating anodized aluminum in sort of a deco style. I, I sold these uh, mainly through the Penland Gallery, actually, and contacts, and from people that I knew that were uh, would commission me to do things. I've done a few things out of steel and stainless steel. I did a few chairs like this. Um, this is a recent table for a client up in Long Island in his beach house. Um, he had the top done out of uh, it's sugar maple from Vermont, and he had a friend of his do the top. And it was really kind of cool because it's, it's like spalted maple, and it still had the holes from, from where they drained the sap out of the trees. So they were like these dark brown voids in it. And we decided it would be great to leave them there, and I figured the kids could have fun shooting peas in them with dinner or something like that. But the, the legs are, um, are clear anodized aluminum, and the, the frame is stainless steel tubing. But that, the top is really gorgeous. The only problem with it is that the guy glued the wood together in the wrong direction. He did it crossways, and so it expands and contracts so much that it cracked on him eventually. And I told him what would happen, but it's still pretty, even with the cracks in it. Um, I do also do a lot of architectural work. This is a, a stairway that I did for a, a friend who has a house actually right across the valley from me at, near Penland. Um, she found three old log cabins up in Virginia and had them put together. And she's got a very eclectic art collection. She's really into colors. This stairway is made out of stainless steel treads and anodized aluminum. I also made that cabinet under a cherry top and glass and stainless steel. Um, 
And back to the Hickory firm again. This, I did uh, basically the whole interior of a house in uh, Roaring Gap up off the parkway up by Sparta, North Carolina. This is a, a railing in the great room. And the, the same thing, I, I did a master of these spindles and she wanted different woods, so I think there are four or five different woods in it. Um, and I don't know if I have a slide. Yeah, it, it's a really a huge room, and it turned out to be a nice railing. Um, a lot of other railings for houses in the area. This is a mahogany top, stainless cable, and they're they're quite. A, this is a, I guess 15 years old, something like that. Um, I make all the hardware for these. You can buy commercial things. Some of them actually now are, are quite nice, but at that time all you could buy was big turnbuckles and they just looked, com looked like commercial elements. And so I machined my own out. I just didn't want to have the association with the commercial things. Mahogany, stainless steel, stainless cable. Uh, this is an island in that same house. Um, once again, terrible slides. Um, a lot of the things that I've done in the last 15 years I never bothered to take photos of. Or if I did, I just took snapshots with a camera because I, you know, it's really no longer associated with academia. So I had no need for slides. Uh, it was really before digital was out. So this is just a digital shot off of a photograph. So quality's not exquisite by any stretch of the imagination. Again, making little elements to hold the glass all anodized. Um, being a self-employed metalsmith, you do whatever you can do to make some money. And so I've done several maces. Uh, this was for a university down on the coast in North Carolina. Um, the, they wanted elements of the indigenous trees in the area. So there's a pine cone from the pine cones, and there's a live oak in it, a cast top that's gold-plated. Um, the commercial photo etching for their emblems. A lot of the parts are cast or turned. Um, another one for the law school in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Once again, they have certain things that they want to be included in it. Mother of Pearl, Oak. Um, another thing that is sort of an ongoing thing is I, I do medals for the North Carolina Museum of Art that they give to donors, usually two or three a year, and also for the Communities and Schools program. They, they give them to outstanding educators in the field. Um, these are, I guess, about three and a half inches in diameter. Um, they're mainly machined out of bronze and, and sterling, um, cold constructed. And I have a friend that has a, an etching, or excuse me, an engraving machine, and so he does the engraving for me. Um, I, I don't do a lot of jewelry. These, this is an example of some of the earlier stainless rings that I do. I've done, in the past, earrings and things out of anodized aluminum, niobium, niobium titanium, and other metals. But currently, the, these are the only jewelry things that I'm doing. Um, Another thing that I, is sort of an ongoing thing are um, medical research equipment things. Um, a friend of mine and a, a client started a corporation in, in Durham, North Carolina called uh, Cogent Neuroscience. And he had as his principal some of the neurobiologists from Duke University. And what they were doing was they were um, mapping the, the human DNA chain. And what they were looking for was a gene that repaired cells. And if they could isolate that, they figured they could clone it and they could use it for stroke victims. If, the, if someone had a stroke, they could have cloned cells that they could in inject into the brain and hopefully the person wouldn't lose motor function and, and whatnot, which was, uh, you know, sort of a lofty thing to do, but it was great. And, um, the guy who started it was sort of a visionary, and he had all these scientists working for him in his corporation, and he had been a photo student at Penland, and so he arranged it so he could bring all of his employees to Penland, and we had sort of a retreat with uh, a bunch of us invited artists 
to mingle with the scientists and talk about how we approach problem solving, what we do, why we do it, and things like that, to, to see the differences between the way scientists work and the way artists work. And we concluded that we're a lot more alike than we're not alike. But out of that came this uh, avenue of work, this uh, pathway, because uh, they needed equipment for it. And they knew what they wanted the equipment to do, but they didn't know how to design it. And so then they'd go to engineers and designers to design it. And then they'd have to go to machinists and fabricators to fabricate it. And it just wasn't working. And after visiting my studio, they decided that I could probably do all of it, which was great for me. And so I started doing these things. This is actually called a stereotax. And what it is is that little gold pin in the front gets super glued to a mouse's skull uh, to hold them really rigid because if they look in their brain with a microscope and his heart beats or he moves, um, they can't see anything. Um, so I designed this system. It's got a little bed with a heated pad in it. Um, it's a live mouse when they do this. and I guess it's better to do it to a mouse than it is to a human. But, um, so I, I do a few of these every year. Um, uh, Mainly now it's for uh, the neurobiologists at Duke University and whenever their grad students or their post-grad students graduate and go off to places like the National Institute of Health and other places, they need duplications of the equipment. And so um, I'm about the only one doing it. And it's really kind of exciting to do because it's a noble cause, it pays well, and I like to do things that look good. I think it's important for people to have in their life things that are aesthetically pleasing. Um, this is actually a rat brain slicer. <laughs> what, yeah, I know it sounds horrible. But the brain is not attached to the mouse at this point. But, but the way they do this research is they uh, take a mouse brain, which is it's still a living brain, or it's you know it's not dead yet, and. It's sliced. These brain slicers are much like an egg slicer, you know, the ones with the little wires that you push down over the egg. Only the wires are 20 thousandths thick tungsten wire, which is really strong. And they're wound on a little frame, and then it fits in this, and they slice it up, and then they take a tweezers in a saline solution, and they pick it up, and they put it on a piece of agar, or agar, I'm not sure what it is, it's sort of an inert substance. And then they uh, get human DNA into it. And the way they do that is they take gold dust, really fine gold dust, because it's really heavy, uh, it's dense, and they attach human DNA to it. And then they've got this little six-shooter pistol that was designed for the hybridization of broccoli. And it's got a little, <laughs> I'm not making this up. <laughs> And, and it shoots this gold dust into the tissue, and then they put it in a, in a I don't know what you call it, it's a, like an oven that's at you know, 98.7 degrees or something like that. And they, they keep watching it, and they say which, see which tissue lives and which dies. And if they find some, some of the tissue that stays living, they do more work in that area and try and isolate it. Um, and along with this, I, I designed and made a winder because they have these little frames that are about the size of a 35 millimeter slide. They would have to hand wind those and it would take the technicians maybe an hour to wind each one, which really slowed their production down. So I came up with sort of a Ferris wheel system that had a motor on it and they could put uh, three or four frames in it, push the button and it would wind them and they'd clamp them off and they'd have four or five frames in the matter of minutes, which really sped the production up. Unfortunately, after 911, they lost all their funding. So this firm is no longer in business which was bad for me because it was good money and I had a bunch of stock. <laughs> this is another piece of one of those, all machined out of stainless steel. This is a, a different version of it, which is, uh, it'll move in three axis rather than two. Um, another thing that I do, uh, being at Penland, there are a lot of craftspeople, a lot of glass blowers in the area, and I found that glass blowers can make nice things, but they don't know how to present them usually. And so I make bases for a different a glass artist. Um, they're, each one's slightly different because none of the two pieces are the same. And it looks much better than one of those plexiglass plate holders that some people use. 
um, all machined out of aluminum, uh, clear anodized, some of my color anodized, depending on the, the color of the piece. Um, some of these I designed the base and manufacture them uh, myself. And then there are other glass blowers that know exactly what they want, and they draw them out perfectly and bring me blueprints, which is sometimes a lot easier. This is a huge piece of glass. I think it weighs 300 pounds, something like that. I'm sorry? They cast the it's cast, yeah. It's, it's Mark Pizer's. It's an incredible piece of glass. It's an opal glass, and when you put light behind it, it just shimmers. Um, Kim was talking about this morning about how she pr approaches things. She works at Starbucks or does whatever to get money to buy her time to work in the studio. I do a similar thing, but I do it in my studio. I manufacture motorcycle parts, um, whatnot, and get the money to do that. And so it's similar in that, uh, you know, I'm doing other people's work to get money so I can do my own work. Um, about four years ago, I built a new studio. This is a, looks tiny here, but it's actually a 40 by 50 metal building, which doubled the space that I had. Um, it's a mess. Everything I have is a mess, but people are amazed at the work that comes out of there, comes out of this studio. But it, it's all heavy equipment, machinist tools. I've got a, a spray booth in there that's uh, up to code as far as uh, air quality. Um, another thing that I really enjoy, and I guess is my hobby, and one thing that keeps me going, is uh, motorcycles. And I do a lot of different things in there. This is a, a local guy who landed his airplane pretty hard, and so I had to repair that. He buckled the whole bottom side of it. Um, this is my motorcycle. Um, it's what keeps me moving, I guess. That, and riding them, that's me winning the race in front. So. Okay, so thank you. If you have any questions... Okay, the, the question that was uh, given to us each, I'd like to answer that by saying, um, what keeps me coming back day after day? Um, one thing, I don't have anything else to do, or there's nothing else that, <laughs> that I want to do, and also money. If I don't go in the studio and work, I don't have any money. Um, and how do I keep it fresh? I, th I think it's because I do different things all the time. You know, every day is a different thing, and I, I am lucky enough to have the ability to pick and choose what I want to do. Some things I make no money on at all, and some things I do, but that's my option. Um, you know, I, I really envy the people that say they've got such a passion that they get up every morning and can't wait to get in the studio. Um, I don't know if I believe them or I want something they're smoking. <laughs> It's, it's work. Sometimes you just don't feel like working. And when I was in grad school, um, Brant and I talked about that. And he said that when he felt like working and he had good ideas, he worked as hard as he could because he knew there was going to come a time, which does periodically, when he didn't feel like working and he didn't have any ideas, which that's always stuck with me. You know, when I'm on a roll, I try and roll with it. You know. Thank you. If you have questions... Um, I'll feel them, but I probably need an interpreter because in a situation like this, my hearing is so bad from the rock and roll band. I think I played Inagata de Vida and Foxfire and, and way too many times too loud. Are there any questions? <laughs> yes. Stand, stand. Um, it says in your bio that you're a teacher. You didn't talk about that. I was oh, I, when I got out of grad school, um, I went straight to Penlin and I taught the, the concentration for about five years, both fall and spring. And I did a sabbatical replacement for two years at Purdue and couldn't, get to, couldn't wait to get out of there. It was back in the flatland, boring. You know, um, and I've done sabbatical replacement things, but I never got a university job when I, I wanted to initially. Um, but for a long period there, there were no men hired whatsoever in the universities. It was all women because all of that uh, equal employment thing got pushed in the art departments. Um, that's part of the reason. Plus, I think they were on to me. You know, I'm. 
they knew I wasn't university material. Plus, I'm not very articulate. I don't interview well at all. So basically, I'm self-employed, which I'm glad of now. Except now all my friends are retired, and they're making more in their pension than I ever made. <laughs> so I can never retire. Are there any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Do you have studio assistants? No. No. Um, that would be too confining. I'd have to be too regular. I'd have to be there on time. And generally, I find that it's quicker to do it myself. You know, I think I could make a lot more money if I was able to have assistants or apprentices and actually direct them. But I had my fill of that at Parker Guitar. There's a, a major difference between the people who are the principals who are dedicated to what they're doing and the people that it's just a job. You know, it's really frustrating, or it was for me at least. Okay. Yes? Um, I always have questions, I'm sorry. But I know I was fascinated that a scientific organization would come to a group of artists to see how artists think. That really, I've never visited. No, I hadn't either. He was, um, Max is a real visionary, and the way he ran this company, he was really relaxed about it. I mean, if you go over there to the company, it appeared as though no one was doing anything. They were sitting around talking, and that's the way he wanted it. And he thought the company would be more productive if they could do what they wanted to do, if they were committed to doing it, and doing it on their own time. And it seemed to work. You know, it really did. I thought it was pretty phenomenal, too, but it did seem to work. So, I never thought of artists really as, I mean, we're problem solvers, but I didn't know we were famous for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, c certainly you're problem solvers. If you try and design something, you've got certain criteria that you're designing around, you know, price points, you know, what, who the client is, you know, things like that. So, it's not all that different. No, it really isn't. Thank you.